This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 94 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me here on the Homestead Journey My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, this episode is going to be a little bit of a different one in that, well, hopefully right now, God willing, I'm on vacation. And so I actually recorded this episode ahead of time. And so I have no homestead happenings because I have no idea what took place on the homestead this week. My guess is probably a lot of it was us getting ready for vacation, but who knows? (laughs) But I do have a great interview for you today, and I am privileged to be joined by Holly Stockley from the Vintage Americana podcast, as well as the BrambleberryMeadow.com blog. Holly is a full-time veterinarian as well as a mother of two special needs girls. She and her husband are working to build an independent farmstead on 10 acres in Michigan with the intent of adding various heritage breeds of livestock. In what she laughingly calls her spare time, she likes to create a warm and comfortable home while indulging her love of sewing, knitting, baking, and whatever else catches her fancy. On today's interview, Holly and I talk about the challenges of raising special needs children on a homestead, how having special needs children impacted their journey into homesteading, and her thoughts on what other families who have special needs children might want to consider if they are thinking about homesteading. Along the way, we talk about a bunch of other things have a few good laughs. I think you're going to enjoy this interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did chatting with Holly. With that, Holly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here. Let's start by you just giving me a little bit about your background and kind of what led you into into homesteading. Sure. Um, Professionally, I am a veterinarian. I have a DVM. Um, I graduated from school intending to go into large animal medicine. And I went back and forth a little bit, you know, our first few years um, out here, I've done some large animal medicine. Um, I've done some exclusively companion, but um, a year or two after we were married, um, our first daughter was born and she was a micro preemie. So 28 weeks, two and a half pounds, Um, and that leads you to lots and lots of kind of follow-up care and therapy and things that follow on from that. Um, and I made it work for most of kind of her early years, but the one thing about large animal medicine is there is no such thing as a nine to five job, Mm -hmm. um, doing large animal medicine. So it got more and more difficult as the years went on to be pulled away at two o'clock in the morning, um, over and over and over again. And it wasn't really good for anybody as good as my husband is at putting up with that kind of stuff. It's still, you know, I'm tired and cranky and she was a light sleeper. And so I kind of gradually got away from that. Um, but I missed it. And at the same time, you know, our original plan had been house in the suburbs, you know, two kids and, and we do all of that kind of thing. And we do right now have a house in town, um, in the little, little village that we live in. But, um, you do those kinds of things when you're expecting that you can throw your kids outside and say, don't come back until dinner time and let them play with the other neighborhood kids. Um, which was very much how I grew up kind of in a subdivision full of kids. And when your kids get to be that age and you discover that you cannot let them out of the house unsupervised because they have no sense of danger and you can't trust them to not go near the road. Um, my youngest is actually nonverbal. Um, 
it's more of an instance when, and she has gotten out of the house on us when our, our backs were turned and you're suddenly calling the local police department and handing out maps of all of the swimming pools in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And everybody's going out to, to look for your missing child as quickly as possible. That stops seeming like a good idea. Mm-hmm. And because my husband and I had both kind of grown up in extended farm families, both of my maternal and paternal grandparents had family farms. Um, that was kind of how he grew up too. We started looking at each other and going, maybe this would be a better life. And so we've gotten to the point now where we've bought acreage and we're sort of in the process of getting everything shifted out in that direction, build a house and kind of be able to raise them where we can go out the back door and not have to have a hand on them every second. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of it probably came from to discovering that um, our oldest has and now is going back this summer to a program locally called Growing Roots which is a farm-based therapy program for developmentally disabled teenagers and adults. And uh, they call her the chicken whisperer. Uh, She loves the chickens. She loves the ducks. She's about the only one that can catch the chickens and the Dutch. For whatever reason, they just let her. And you can go there and she'll be sitting there when I go to pick her up just with a duck in her arms, petting it. I have pictures of it. And so we kind of decided maybe that was going to be a good switch. And that was kind of what, what led us in that direction. Nice. So it's one of the questions I get, I get very frequently is, is, you know, about homesteading with, with children. And it's very difficult for me to, to answer those questions because I have one child. Right. So, um, you know, certainly uh, I, I would claim no expertise in that area. But certainly when you're dealing with special needs children, that adds a layer of, of complexity yeah. to life um, and to this lifestyle that um, it is, you know, I guess above and beyond the complexity of the right. lifestyle. Right. And, and yet for you guys, um, it sounds to me like it, it's, it's, um, almost uh, uh well i think you use the term therapy um right. for for your oldest and there's a sense of security that you are you are finding for your younger right. child yeah um and so i i find that very very interesting because i think many people might look at it just the opposite right um and i guess every child is unique um yes. whether special needs or uh, a child w- without um special needs um Every child is unique, but for you to have found something that um, provides uh, therapy for your for your oldest in in uh, through farm animals, to me, I think is is absolutely wonderful. Right, and you know you have to be just that little extra bit cautious because they don't understand the concept of you know these animals can be dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know, will I ever have a bull on the property? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I don't know if you've ever been over or familiar with Mackinac Island. I've heard of it. I've I've never been. It's a a tiny little island up in Lake Michigan. And the unique thing about it is that cars are not permitted. Mm -hmm. So we've been up a few times on vacation. And one thing that we figured out real quickly is that my youngest loves it because it's quiet. Mm. I mean, it's just the level of noise when you get out onto the island and you get just a little bit away from, from the harbor where the ferries are. And it just all of the sudden the noise level drops to something that's hard to get most other places Mm -hmm. that you go in casual, you know, traveling. Mm -hmm. And that was another kind of thing that led us in this direction was, you know, she really does not like the general level of noise that you and I tune out on a daily basis because she just can't. Mm -hmm. We take her out in public. We usually give her some kind of headphones, noise canceling headphones or something to try and help her cope with it. Mm -hmm. She'd much rather not wear them because they're not all that much comfortable, but, you know, and so we get her out on the property and let her walk around and she's just happy as a clam because again, it's, you know, and it's surrounded pretty much on four sides. We first bought it. We actually had to kind of hack our way in with a pair of loppers and a machete and make a path, 
<laughs> to this parcel because it had been so neglected for so long. And so you've got a lot of screening that keep down the noise and it's kind of a more rural area. You get a little bit of road noise, but really not very much. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, was a, a plus for her too. Nice. Nice. Now, how far away from you where you currently live is the property? It's about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. So, so we run back and forth on almost a daily basis. Nice. Nice. And so kind of what's your, um, where are you at, I guess, in, in kind of building out uh, yeah. um, homestead there? House plans are currently out with an engineer who's taking them back through. Cause of course we, we started toward building the house just at the wrong time mm -hmm. as all of this hit and the cost of dimensional lumber went up 400%. Mm -hmm. um, and basically suddenly it was 40% more to build the same house than it was you know, two months before. And the one thing that didn't go up nearly as much as the cost of doing uh, timber framing and SIPs. And so the plans are currently in the hands of an engineer who's reworking the numbers to do things that way. Okay. And we'll kind of come back around and, and bid through it. So I think we'll probably hopefully be looking at breaking ground within the next 12 months. And the plan is kind of house and initial barn as an outbuilding will kind of go up first. Um, we've got part of a garden started. Um, my next plan before hopefully it gets too much uh, more toward fall. I have a, a whole row of little grafted bench graft apple trees here that I mean to move out there kind of as a nursery row. And so trying to do the long-term projects first. Mm -hmm. and and get those started even though uh it may be a little while before we get moved out completely mm -hmm. we're not super comfortable putting livestock out there until we move out um because we know there are predators mm -hmm. um, i've come upon deer bits because the coyotes have left the inedible pieces um walking the dogs and i know that that happened the night before uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> i've had to make one of the dogs drop a little bit of bear spore this spring i've gone hmm hives not looking like such a good idea unless i put an electric fence around them right right so you know a lot of stuff will wait until we can be right there to monitor it mm -hmm. but some things we can do now so like i said the apple trees will go out there the garden's getting sort of started and baby steps Right. Yeah. And I, and that's one of the things I tell people all the time. It's, it's very easy when you're getting started to want to do all the things, yeah. to grow all the things, to raise all the things. And so to, to, to kind of temper that enthusiasm right. and to, you know, to understand that, yes, we want to have animals. Now's not yep. the time yep. um, is, is shows a lot of wisdom on your part in a well, sense of, um, I guess I would call self-control that I probably <laughs> might lack a little bit. We, it, we did too. We had chickens for a little while until one of the neighbors turned us in. Mm. <laughs> you know, Cause technically speaking, you know, it, we talked to the people on either side of us and behind us. And we didn't think to check with the guy across the street who just apparently was offended by the very concept, even though he could neither see nor hear them. Uh, but, uh. and and the kids had all kinds of fun with them while we had them. So we're, we're looking forward to be able to do that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that, that is, that is one of the things that uh, is tough when you're in um, more of a suburban uh, yeah. setting where you have those, those rules and it's, it's very frustrating, yeah. but uh, at the end of the day, it is what it is. And uh, you know, I commend you for at least giving it a go. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, it, it doesn't always work out well. So now where you're located at now, how big of a property do you have in town? It's a fairly small city lot um, and it's kind of laid out a little bit goofy. So I can't fence it. Um, and it's got an aging sprinkler system kind of laid through the, the lawn. So it's actually hard to put in much of a garden. I have a couple of raised beds. But if you dig anywhere else, you're probably going to hit something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's been kind of, you know, I've tried to do a few things here and there. I have a couple of spalliate apple trees along one fence, uh, but it's been pretty limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, you, and, and, and it doesn't matter where you go. I mean, we're constrained by some of the stuff that we have here that you deal with. Right. Um, you're never going to find that perfect uh, situation, but all, yes. you, all you can do is try to do the best you can with what you've got to work with and, uh, and then try to formulate a plan to kind of keep, 
leveling up and and yeah. know, trying to kind of take things to the next level. Certainly, I, I think I'm um, thinking the long game with the apple trees and uh, that that is again, you're, you're showing much more smarts than I did here. Um, I finally got around to planting apple trees last year and my son was so excited, so excited. Uh, and he's like, dad, how soon are we going to get our first apples? <laughs> I was like, well, bud, it's probably gonna be like four or five years. And it was yeah. like, I just punched him right in the gut and his face dropped. And he, he said, but dad, by then I'll be in college. If you would have listened to me 10 years ago, like, oh, okay. All right. All right. Point well taken. He's got a point. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. You know, my three-year-old tree has two apples on it this year. Nice. <laughs> and the deer will probably get them before I do. Yeah, that unfortunately is is usually the case. So while you're kind of in this transition stage, um, it's not like you're sitting there doing nothing. No. Um, and as I follow you on on Instagram and and um, and so forth, um, you've got some things that, that that you're up to. So tell me a little bit about some of the things that you've been doing lately. Well. I went to school originally, um, I was a double major animal science microbiology because there at the time, and I'm not going to mention what year it was, um, (laughs) was no such thing as a degree in genetics. So I made one up as I went along. So my first love is really genetics and biodiversity. So I have a special place in my heart for heritage livestock Mm -hmm. and some of it has been, all right, looking around at this piece of property and going, what could we have and what makes sense, both in terms of what's right for us and where could we kind of participate in saving some of these heritage breeds. So we're probably going to use sheep. Um, And in fact, I've got some contact with a lady that raises Rommeldales who used her sheep to clear land. Mm-hmm. And the thing with sheep is that uh, they will do that if they've kind of been taught that those things are okay to eat. And her sheep have been taught that those things are okay to eat. And it's been communicated from mother to daughter. And so I can bring them out here and probably not have a lot of trouble getting them to help me get some of the overgrowth under control. Um, and so I've got some projects like that in the works. Uh, we'd like to kind of do some intensive managed grazing and get most of it cleared and then work it as a silva pasture. Um, and I enjoy kind of digging up heritage skills. So I have a plan to put an English hedge um, along the back boundary of the, the property. Um, that's something that I wanted to get it in this spring, but everything being disrupted kind of made a lot of the if your local soil conservation district typically does like a, a sale of mm-hmm. real inexpensive stuff, there was much less availability of the kinds of things I wanted this year than there've been previously. And that there probably will be next year. So next year I'm kind of planning to, to plant that hedge. And then it'll be again, long-term project mm-hmm. four or five years before you come in and you actually lay that into a hedge. And then a couple years more before I'd feel comfortable with stock not being able to get through it. Mm -hmm. And that's even if you've been able to plug all the holes and and make it bull strong and hog tight the way they're supposed to be. Right. So those are a couple of the little things we've got going. Nice. Yeah. I mean, definitely heritage breeds close to my heart. Um, You know, I, I big believer in that it's a direction we're trying to take our homestead here. Uh, it was a kind of American guinea hog that got me headed down that uh, down that rabbit hole, and right. um, yeah, I I just absolutely think it's uh, it's a great way to go. And your background um, is just well well suited <laughs> for that. So yeah. I'm I'm excited to follow that journey, and um, I just think that's awesome. A big believer here in in as you can putting animals to work and letting them do the work for you. I think it's such a smart way to homestead. Now we only have a little over two acres of land, right? So it's, it's not like I have a ton of opportunity to do that, but when I've been able to, we've used, you know, ducks and geese and pigs to till land, to create a garden space. We put in a roost out bed last year and that was all prepped to using animals. Yes. Um, 
So definitely, I, I think it's such a great way to go. And so again, very excited to, to kind of follow that journey with you. Now, you also do some canning. I do. Um, so you've been doing some um, uh, jellies and jams lately, correct? Mostly, yeah, because I don't have a whole lot of storage space where I am. And I don't have a lot of garden space where I'm suddenly, you know, faced with eight bushels of tomatoes and, and nowhere to put them. So typically I'm going out, you know, picking or, or buying fruits. And so we're dealing with a little smaller quantities. Um, but we use a lot of jam and, and jelly and those are fun things to put up. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, my mother and her family, they grew up very, very poor. Um, there was no electricity in that house until she was in high school. Um, I was 18 before there was more than one faucet, cold water only. If you wanted a bath, you heated water in the stove and a tea kettle. Um, and so the whole idea of, you know, pressure canners were kind of alien to her and even sure gel. And, and that was like a Johnny come lately. So <laughs> I tend to take a lot of leaves from her book and, and not necessarily be as wedded to the ball blue book of canning as somebody who's maybe not done it for, for years. It's kind of, eh, if it looks like it may not have enough pectin, grate a green apple in it, you'll be fine. <laughs> and knowing what that gelling point looks like, but it's, mm -hmm. it's always kind of fun. And I don't think there's many things more satisfying than sitting there and listening to the little soft pops of each yes. jar as they seal. Yes. I, I just love that so much. That ping uh, is just so, so satisfying. Yep. Um, and, and I'm with you. Uh, jams and jellies are probably my favorite thing to can. Yeah. We do a lot of pressure canning, a lot of hot water bath canning. Right. Um, but uh, for me, there's just something about jams and jellies that I just, I absolutely love. And yep. uh, now you, I believe you're also a quilter, correct? Yep. Sewing and quilting both. And that's something that I think sometimes people tend to leave out of the homesteading genre. We think mm. of more the, the food preparation thing. Right. But when you really look back at, uh, you know, the quote unquote good old days, although I'm right. not quite sure I want to go back to the good old days. I think <laughs> I'm pretty happy here. Right. Uh, but a big part of people um, making do on the home was not just the food you ate, but it was the clothes you wore. Yes. It was, you know, putting quilts on the bed and, yes. and so forth. And my mom, huge quilter, um, does everything by hand, hand stitches, everything, um, and, and just loves it. Now that's not my cup of tea, right? I will tell you right now, I would probably want to stab myself in the eyeball with the <laughs> dull pencil, uh, before I would want to quilt. But I, I really think that's another great aspect of homesteading that, again, I feel like sometimes just gets overlooked as yeah. we think so much about raising and growing food. Right. And I spent a lot of time, you know, I use a machine, but I do also have a treadle machine. Um, I have both, you know, both the electric and the treadle. Um, and my uncle actually buys old Singer treadle machines and restores them and sells them to the Amish. Oh, wow. It's the back running again. And so I, I have a resource there if I need an extra belt or, or things like that. Uh, and I find it kind of meditative uh, sometimes. Sometimes I find it kind of sweary depending on what I'm doing. <laughs> but, <laughs> just ask my husband. Um, but I do think it is kind of part of that whole concept still of keeping home and taking care Um especially because this is a cold climate. Um, mm -hmm. And even in the, the most well-built house in the middle of the winter, you may not have your thermostat cr cranked up to 72 mm -hmm. and it's much, much nicer to curl up and watch TV under a nice quilt. Absolutely. And, and even, even if you can crank the, uh, the, the, the thermostat up, there's just something very homey and comforting mm -hmm. to yeah. a, to a nice quilt. Um, and not just that, but, um, there's something to be said about, especially when you understand the work that goes into uh, quilting, right. when somebody gives you a quilt or you have something that was, you know, I have quilts that were made by my great grandmother. Yes. Um, and just that heirloom, um, you know, that heritage connection that you have to your past. Right. The quilts that my mom has made for us. Yes. Um, there's just something about that, that when you, 
when you wrap yourself up in that, you're, you're getting a hug from that person. Yep. And sometimes, and, uh, you know, you're saving fabric from other things you've made and you can look back and then go, oh, this piece was, you know, mm-hmm. from the dress I wore to my sixth grade graduation and, and that all could, can factor into that as well. And even clothing, you, you could repurpose stuff. Um, mm-hmm. My mother very famously caught up one of my dad's old Navy uniforms to make a little set of overalls for my sister when she was about three or four years old because she just couldn't see the sense in wasting good wool. <laughs> nice. Dad's nice. like, it's still a good uniform. She's like, you're never going to wear it again. You're out. Just <laughs> hand it over. And mm-hmm. she let him keep one. Yeah. And nice. the rest of them got made into <laughs> they, other stuff. Made something, yeah, something useful. My mom actually has um, a couple of uh, family members of ours that passed away over the past several years. And my mom has actually taken shirts from them yeah. and uh, turned them into, I, I think they call them quillos. Yes. Um, the quilt pillow thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and again, it's just, there's that connection that um, it, it's that heritage kind of thing that I think is just amazing. So kind of your, your background was in with, with the live or the large animal thing. And then through, through your daughters, you've kind of been moved in this direction of, of, of homesteading and, and so forth. Um, along the way, you decided to start a podcast yourself. I did. And it's kind of focused on you. It's called uh, Vintage Americana Podcast, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. So tell me a little bit about how you kind of got into that. I think it kind of came from, um, you know, I kept bouncing off concepts within the homesteading community that I kind of, I got it, but I didn't always necessarily want to go entirely that way. So, you know, self-sufficiency is all well and good, but nobody's ever a hundred percent self-sufficient. Um, Absolutely. and, and some people can get a little bit, uh, obsessed mm-hmm. um and of course you know one of the things my husband and i did do when we were first married um before we did the homesteading lifestyle idea we had actually done the historical reenactment lifestyle and that is an entire lifestyle um and i know people who have taken a raw fleece cleaned it spun it woven fabric and make an address that way lies insanity <laughs> um <laughs> You, you just, there aren't enough hours in the day. And if we all wanted to provide for every one of our single needs, we could all barely scrape out a subsistence living. Correct. You know, part of the joy of a uh, division of labor is that it allows us all to live better than we would if we weren't doing that. Correct. Specialization is a thing. Yes. So, you know, I wasn't really looking entirely at self-sufficiency and even sustainability, you know, that's a good concept too, but sustainability is math. Mm -hmm. How much can I take off this field and still leave it in a condition to produce the same amount next year? Mm -hmm. That's okay, but it's missing something. And in my mind, it's stewardship. And stewardship is looking at that and saying, how can I leave that parcel better than it was when it came into my hands? That's good. Not just use what's there, Mm -hmm. but to make it more Mm -hmm. than it was. And so I kind of came from that concept and, and uh, actually was just talking with uh, my friend, Marion McNeely, doing an interview with her today. And we talked a little bit about is sort of kind of, I would call it an offshoot baby of the, the whole homestead movement. Have, are you familiar with cottage core? I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. Cottage core is an aesthetic where you'll see um, lots of pictures posted of, you know, women in sprigged cotton dresses standing on a breezy hill, holding a chicken. Uh, it is kind of the Marie Antoinette view of homesteading almost and so i kind of was looking at all of these pieces and going all right let's actually pull that all together and go back and look for not just the skills but the values that used to support lifestyles in rural america and let us to be able to do those things and interact with each other in 
that sense of community that we're kind of losing. That's, so that that's, was my motivation. And that's great stuff. I, I, yeah. Um, so, so cottage core then would kind of be just, just exploring that for a little bit. It, it's kind of that almost, I would call it, maybe this is too judgmental on my part, but uh, that idyllic pie in the sky faux perspective of homesteading. Would yeah. That be? Yeah. Or to quote Marion this morning, the pretty, pretty princess version. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of like the, it's, it's the, the chicken coops that you see on Instagram and Pinterest that are pristine with the chandeliers in there. And you just yes. realize that a chicken has never been within two miles of that chicken coop, except that, for that photo op. That nails cottage core. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, and that's one of the things that, uh, um, for me, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll kind of plug an upcoming interview that I have. I'm going to be interviewing Amy from a farmish kind of life. Oh yes. Podcast. She's fun. She is so great. And, uh, but she's kind of the antithesis yes. of, of cottage core. That I would agree and, with that. And in fact, that is going to be the topic, uh, for our, our, um, uh, our interview or kind of the theme. And that is kind of keeping it real, right. Uh, you know, in the Instagram and Pinterest age. <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's one of the things that I feel like, and especially as content creators, as, as we are, as we are sharing with people, um, things that we're excited and passionate about, I think it's very important for us to provide, um, a full picture and not just give them the pretty, Right. Uh, and sell them something that is absolutely fake. Right. Um, because then people are going to come into it and they're going to be extremely disappointed and disillusioned when things stink and yep. animals die and yep. um, jelly doesn't gel. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, and I'd give you the, the uh, kind of parallel to that. Um, you familiar with James Harriet? I love James Harriet. Uh, sometimes I love James Harriet. And sometimes I would like to drag him out beside the woodshed and beat him black and blue for lying about what this <laughs> profession is really like. Uh, yeah, that's definitely, you know, for all that these are all these stories and they're not always necessarily entirely happy in and of themselves. It's a very curated version of, you know, what, of what a vet, what is. vet's life is mm -hmm. like. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and, and I can see you having lived that life and been called out at two o'clock in the morning. Yep. Um, although he does sometimes paint a, uh, a picture of, um, you know, kind of lying in the gutter with his arm up to, uh, you know, up to his shoulder as he's lying there in a drunken stupor <laughs> because he just, just come from the pub. Um, it definitely, I, I, I can see where you'd be coming from. And I think that is, that's always the, um, there's that tension that we have yeah. of, of trying to, I, on the other hand, you also don't want to be whiny, whiny, woe is me. Right, right. Um, well, and, and so sometimes, you know, you don't want to share it when it happens. It's funny later. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember being out one night and putting in a prolapsed uterus on a cow. Um, which for somebody my size is a little trying because my arms aren't quite long enough. So we use this trick of using a wine bottle to kind of shove the, the horn in question back where it's supposed to be. And it involves laying on whatever surface the cow is laying on to get it done. And it was July and it was hot. And I got finished at about seven o'clock and I'd been out there for three hours. And I stripped off my coveralls and threw them in the trunk of the car and headed home. And I thought, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to stop at McDonald's without taking into account the fact that I had sluiced off in my bucket of water, but everything had soaked through my coveralls. Uh, and I walked in and I ordered, and they were the politest McDonald's employees that you've ever seen as they handed me my food. And it wasn't until I walked out that I went, you know, I'm covered with blood and goo. And they probably think there's a body in the back of my car and they don't want to be the next body in the back <laughs> of my car. So, you know, note to self, carry a clean t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's awesome that's awesome um so uh, we, we give me a little bit more information with regards to kind of some of the topics that you cover on your podcast because it's not just about homesteading again it's vintage no. yep. americana and so you're looking at it 
from a little bit of a different perspective than just through the filter of homesteading. Yeah. Um, and like today, you know, Mary and I had a, a discussion about um, getting away from fast fashion and kind of a return to um, handmade clothing and different styles of clothing that aren't necessarily maybe uh, so dependent on stretch fabrics. Leggings are not pants. Um, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've done things like that. Um, I've talked about uh, different, and I have some plans on, on talking about uh, community development and, and how you become part of a local community, how you plug into that. And yes. that it's important to start going to, you know, the, the pancake breakfast, yes. um, down at the VFW hall. And, um, I remember one of the guys that I worked for used to always do the lemonade stand for the lions club, um, for the 4th of July. And mm -hmm. that was just his thing. And you'd watch everybody in town come up and half of the time they didn't really want a lemonade. They wanted to talk to doc for five minutes while he juiced one lemon and put the sugar in the ice cubes in the, the jar and, and shook it for them and served them their lemonade. It was more the experience and talking mm. to Doc than it was about the, the lemonade. <laughs> yeah. Um, and small towns are like that. Yes. And, you know, my parents both grew up in the same tiny town in northern Michigan, and I can still walk up there and I'll be on the street in downtown Charlevoix and I will have people come up to me and go, you're one of Ron Vandenberg's girls how's your dad? You know, I walk into Frisky's farm market and it's a you know big tourist destination and they're waiting on a hundred million people. And all of a sudden this head will pop up in the back. Hi, sweetie. How's your uncle Jim? Tell him I'll drop a check off for the flowers next week. I'm like, Oh, come on. Okay. But <laughs> you know, as much as I might have cringed about that when I was a teenager, you know, downtown hanging out with the coasties and, you know, Bert Boost walking by going, does your father know where you are right now? <laughs> Um, I miss it mm -hmm. now that I'm here because a little bit of our problem is um, one thing about having children with autism is it's very isolating. Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole covey of my children's friends, parents mm -hmm. that are my social circle, you know, even though I have other friends who are parents where that social circle has changed over the years mm -hmm. as their kids' friends change and they do. Um, that's never really been a mm -hmm. part of kind of who we are and and what we do just because my kids don't talk uh to other children much they you know it is what it is and we don't go to a lot of those types of events because i have to have a hand on my youngest at all times and so i appreciate that sort of sense of community more now mm -hmm. and were it financially feasible, I'd probably pull up stakes and move up there. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those areas that's it's very much a tiny resort town and, and the economy just doesn't support other things. And the services that my children need are not available there. And so we kind of got pinned to the floor here. Mm -hmm. And then you sometimes get a little sign because when we were looking for land, that was very difficult too. And we found that uh, the best parcels of land sell through those community channels right. they never come on the open market there is never a real estate sign um and so i had actually sent out a whole bunch of little letters to people that owned parcels of land and this particular one belonged to an orthopedic surgeon who was 87 years old he bought it 30 years ago intending to build on it himself planted three and a half acres in walnut trees and then remarried and kind of moved to another little town with his wife because she's into race horses and had a farm and 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 there it sat for 30 years and so he was willing to let it go to someone that he thought would take care of it where we would be good to it and it would be good to us nice and so so we do have three and a half acres of black walnuts to use as a resource um both for the lumber and you know we one of our intents and one thing we'll have to talk about at some point is uh, running pigs absolutely. especially in the fall when the nuts are dropping absolutely they love that that's <laughs> like we have we have um shag bark hickory where our pigs are and when the wind blows in the fall and those nuts are yeah. dropping they're like spider monkeys on crack i mean it's <laughs> like they're just running around 
<laughs> it's 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 amazing to watch. So yeah, definitely I was gonna bring that up. Like, oh walnut, gotta get some pigs. Yep, gotta that's... get some pigs and American guinea hogs. I mean, <laughs> you, you gotta put your heritage, plug in, yep. yep. Heritage breed, right? Docile, smaller, perfect for people in your situation. So yep. I'm just telling you, so we put may, that in the back of your mind. We may but come to that. Yep. Those American guinea hogs. A number of things that you touched on there that I really, I, I really want to go back to. Um, so, first of all, the importance of community. Um, I, I think that's something that gets so lost in modern homesteading because people are, as you were, you know, like we're pursuing self sufficiency, and we think, well, we don't need anybody else. Yep. And that's 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 not how they did it in the olden days. No, and it, it was never that way. It hasn't been that long. You know, Correct. even when I was young nobody had all the equipment to do all their own fields themselves. And so they would go around from farm to farm. So, you know, we'd cut 180 acre farm, all of their oats or wheat Mm -hmm. in two nights. And then they'd come over to the next guy and the whole crew, everybody would come over and do it. And the farm wife would set supper. And that was Mm -hmm. kind of its own low grade competition Mm -hmm. who could put out the best table for the guys absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> every, every day while they're working but in, and then you always had somebody to borrow something from mm-hmm. if yours broke uh one of the girls at work showed me a picture today she is a hay wagon with a bunch of round bales on it and it's just cracked and sunk right in the middle I'm like well you've got a bit of a problem she's like yep <laughs> second one that broke I'm like you also have no sense of pattern recognition. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's see what we can do yeah, yeah. to try and make this problem better, you know, and find some ways to get maybe fewer bales on the wagon to be a good thing. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, it but being able to have that sense of community, you know, you can turn it into a verb if you want. It's neighboring. Mm-hmm. And we've lost the art of yeah. neighboring. Well, yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, there's a sense to where, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, you read the stories of how they process pigs back in the day, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was a community thing, yeah. you know, they would, they would go from place to place and I help you butcher my pig. And then yeah. I help you butcher your pig. Um, you know, this, the concept of bartering, maybe I raise chickens, you raise pigs, and then we swap, All right. uh, you know, so many things like that. Um, and, and definitely, I think to a certain extent, it's a, been a bit of a, it's, it's a, it's kind of that cultural thing where people, especially people who have moved to the city and there's that sense in the city of, and, and probably for good reason, um, of maybe being a little bit more wary, um, and, and, and less, um, open to trust me. I, I grew up just outside of Flint. Okay. I, I remain harassed by everyone I know to this day out here because I lock my car when I walk away from it. You know, they'll try and put something. Oh, I was going to put this casserole in your car, but it's locked. Yeah. Yes, yes yeah, it well, was because that was, you know, right. how I was taught when I was a teenager because my parents moved from, you know, farm country down to I was mm-hmm. born in Detroit mm-hmm. and raised just outside of Flint. And, you know, I've kind of come back this way. I'm trying to pull them out in this direction now, too, because. It's still, you know, not the best place in the world to be, especially for, you know, an aging elderly couple too, where your ability to be that wary, it diminishes over time. Right. And I would like to have them out here where I could get my little hands on them. Because again, I think we should probably make an effort to get back to multi-generational living. Yes, yes, yes. You know, we, we had the opportunity, um, back in 2007 to we, we relocated back to this area in part to be close to my grandfather is getting up in age. Uh-huh. We, he didn't need anybody with him 100% of the time, but we knew it was getting a spot to where he needed somebody close by. Right. Our plan was to live with him for six months while we looked for a home and then, you know, and then hopefully close by, but right. we ended up being with him for 18 months and not to say that it was all unicorns and rainbows it no wasn't. when you move in with an 85 year old guy who's <laughs> set in his ways and you yep. got a two-year-old kid um there's going to be conflicts along the way but we learned so much from him and yep. it was really through that experience that i got reconnected back to this lifestyle and my love for this yep. and I, I just 
learned so much from him. And my son had an opportunity to, to, to um, get to know my grandfather in ways that he never would have been able to otherwise. Right. And we're actually in the process of having some conversations with regards to my mom and dad are getting up and up in years. I mean, they're mm-hmm. in their, you know, what, late sixties, they're still fine. It's not like they can't live on their own or anything like that. But as we're starting to think about, okay, what are the next steps? They're only 15 minutes away from me. Right. But when you've got three feet of snow on the ground, <laughs> that 15 minutes might as well be 15 hours. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, certainly there's that aspect of it, but certainly that, that ability to, to learn from the generations, Mm -hmm. um, and to pass on, um, the, the skills and the knowledge, um, -hmm. that's, that's so been lost. And I'm, I'm blessed because I was able to tap back into that. Right. Um, and and I'm so thankful for that, but yeah, I 100% agree. One of the other things that you touched on as well. Um, and this is something uh, it, that, um, you know, with regards to when you have children who need certain services, that mm-hmm. certainly does limit yeah. w- where you can kind of go put down roots. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what would your advice be to people who, you know, are who think that this might be good for their children? Right. It might be good for them as a family, but they can't, um, you know, they, they can't move to the middle of Timbuktu. Middle. Right. Well, and what I find is that it actually isn't always necessarily an urban versus a rural thing because um, my community provides services for my kids that would cost me about $80,000 per year per kid were I in the greater Detroit area. And it's not whether or not there's, you know, a large enough population density where I'm at is not, it's not Timbuktu, but it's, you know, kind of that semi-rural, um, we're on the fringes between Grand Rapids and the the coast. Um, and Grand Rapids is not a huge city, but the whole West Michigan coast, uh, was settled by the Dutch and it maintains much of its community feel, um, Grand Rapids was built on community and philanthropy and it maintains that drive that the expectation is even if you're not wealthy you will give back to the community in one way or another and one of the ways that happens is that the community values services for developmentally disabled autism all of those kinds of things and they fund that programming they actually can't go and ask the school can't go and ask for a millage for special education. It's not legal for them to do so. They can't ask for something that's only going to benefit a certain number of students, but they can basically tell the community, Hey, look, we need this much of an increase in our general budget. And this is the portion of it that we're going to put toward our special needs programming. And the community looks at it and goes, okay. And so it's really grown with our kids. There wasn't as much here when we started. And each year as Annalise had progressed through things, um, they appeared. So, you know, there is now a specialty autism classroom in one of the elementary schools. And then it transitions into the junior high schools and they kind of put them out into the, the school for the portion of the day that they can. And they bring them back into that room for the portions of the school day that is just not, not right for them. Mm-hmm. And they go all the way through that. And then even Annalise has graduated from high school, but she's going to go on into a community job skills development program uh, run by the county school district in the fall. So it's not about looking necessarily for the biggest city you can find. That's not where those services are. It's the places that put a high value on providing those things in the community and you really just have to get down on the ground and ask. Um, I'm not sure how you would necessarily search for those services. I mean, it was kind of sheer dumb luck that we happened to be here um, when we ended up needing it, dumb luck, Providence, whatever you want to look at it as. Um, 
but I have actually talked to, uh, there's a gentleman here in town who's a pediatric cardiac surgeon whose son is autistic and he moved here from California because he said he did his research and found this is the best county in the United States to be if you have a child with autism. Wow. So, you know, we just made it a point as we were looking for land to be, all right, we need to maintain ourselves in this municipality because we know this county specifically we're going to look within these county boundaries now we had restricted ourselves to the school district and it turned out we probably didn't need to because we still haven't gotten moved out there and my youngest is not in the school district the county runs a program for the more more heavily affected kids they don't go into the standard school system they kind of keep them all in in one centered place where they've got physical therapy, occupation therapy, speech, all of that kind of stuff, therapeutic riding, swimming pool, kind of all of that kind of stuff for those kids. And so we could have been anywhere in the county um, in hindsight. And we talk about, you know, gee, do we look around and, and sell the parcel we've got? And Because the one thing about it is it's very, very flat. Um, and the water table is only four feet down. So, you know, it, a little soggy. And mm-hmm. So we've talked about that, but we still would maintain it in the county because those services exist. And mm-hmm. I think it's just a matter of looking for, and then some of them are governmental services. Some of them are independent um, type stuff. You just have to kind of ask leading questions, ask, ask the people who would know. So you want to ask the special education teachers in, in a school in a given district, say what kind of services are available. and see if there's something there that's going to be there for your support. And I guess as we kind of get close to wrapping this up, if there is someone who's listening to this, who has a child with special needs and they're trying to evaluate whether or not homesteading is going to be a good fit for them, how, what would be your advice to them um, as far as how to go through that process and understand, because I, I think for, for some, for some kids, homesteading may be the wrong thing. Right. To think that homesteading is the magic, is the magic bullet. It's yeah, no. definitely not what we want to leave Mm-mm. as 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 our impression here. And I think it's you know try and look for things where you can expose them. Can you do a therapeutic writing program? Can you look for see if there is um, some type of you know like the Growing Roots program? There's several of those programs out here. There's another one called uh, Benjamin's Hope, which is a residential program for adults with autism that has a farm with llamas and sheep and rabbits and chickens and and the residents take care of the animals and they sell the goods at a little farm stand down at the road um visit those places they have a big open house every year um i take annalise most years down to the michigan fiber festival because she loves to look at the sheep and pet the sheep and you know just interact um visit the county fair oh yes 4-h You'd be amazed at how accommodating some 4-H clubs are. You know, am I going to turn my kid loose in the ring with a lamp? No, (laughs) that isn't a good idea for anybody. Can she go to some of the other things and participate in some of that stuff? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, had we not been reported, would I have gotten her a chicken to see if she could at least show a chicken? Yeah. Right. Um, do those kinds of things and see, does your child respond or does it turn into a fight? If it's a Mm -hmm. fight, it's no good. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, on the other hand, just like any other kid, it's good for them to have things they don't necessarily want to do that they should do. Um, Chores are not verboten. Mm -hmm. We don't get out of those just because we don't talk. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So it's do all of those little test sort of things Mm -hmm. um, before you, you maybe make the leap. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's, that's great advice. And, and I mean, I, I do think that to a certain extent that holds true for, for, for kids Any in kid. general, Any in, kid. in general, but certainly when you're dealing with, 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 you know, kids that don't have a concept of danger, right. they don't have a concept of, of safe and unsafe behavior, um, you know, certainly putting them you know, where they can get on a tractor and drive off with it um, right. is not what you you, you want to do. So certainly you have to think through, if you're going to pursue this, you yes. need to understand, I think, and this is my, my assumption, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly you need to understand the limitations um, to, to make sure that you're not putting your child yes. in a situation um, that is that is dangerous. Yes. 
you know, and that's always been the case. And there are certain things that don't happen unless both of us are home. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, one of us is available at all times. My husband does not mow the lawn unless I'm home to Mm -hmm. ride herd on both kids. Because Mm -hmm. even when you think that they're not getting into trouble, they can find the darndest things to get into. (laughs) And one thing I didn't ask is what are are the ages? It sounds to me like one you said is graduated from from high school. Yep. She'll be 20 in September. Okay. Uh, And the younger one is 13. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I wanted yeah. to be, I mean, we could keep chatting for, for I mean, there, I think there's just so How many, these things tend to go. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many um, rabbit trails that I would love to go down with you. Um, but I, I, I did promise you, I would be um, uh, cognizant of yeah. your, your, your schedule. Um, Good to which, be bedtime. Yep. yep important. <laughs> so as we wrap things up, um, where can people find you? The podcast is called Vintage Americana and it's available out on Apple Podcasts, you know, iTunes, Spotify, and most of the apps there. There's also a website where you can just go directly and listen right on your computer if you prefer that. And that's vintageamericanapodcast.com. Um, I am on Instagram. I kind of maintain two accounts, one for the podcast specifically, that's Vintage Americana Podcast. And I have a blog that's called Brambleberry Meadow. So there is a brambleberrymeadow.com and there's an Instagram account for that too. Excellent. I will put a link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been a joy chatting with you. And uh, I hope people have been able to um, learn more about you. And hopefully if there are people that are listening with, with kids with special needs, that this has really been helpful to them. And if they have any questions, they can reach out to you via the- uh, the social media accounts. Yep. So, yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. Brian can be reached by emailing him at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or by contacting him via our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support this podcast, we invite you to become a member of the Supporting Listeners Program. For $10 a month, or $100 per year, you will receive access to a community of like-minded individuals via a private Facebook group, at least one monthly live Q&A with Brian, the opportunity to participate in live recordings of the podcast, access to an ever-expanding library of helpful homesteading content, and so much more. Head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net for more information and to sign up today. As always, the music on this episode was provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.